We have been in this desert for 500 years. And I can't even drink from this one oasis because this isn't even real water. It's dead god water. And you know, I don't really think that we should drink the remains of the last Hydro Archon. I really wouldn't want to end up like this guy, you know. But now that I think about it, we'll be traveling to Fontaine soon, right? And in that case, maybe now is a good time for some region pre-release speculations. I have nothing clever to say here for a transition, so let's just dive into some speculations on the Nation of Water. <laughs> dive. Nation of Water. It's a fun. Okay, so based on some conversations with some Fontaine NPCs, the Nation of Water is considered to be a center of art, culture, technology, and bureaucracy. And that last one's not so fun. Fontaine's administration appears to thrive on endless rules and regulation, and it seems that these rules change pretty often and sometimes without warning. This creates a lot of confusion in the general population because it's not uncommon for someone to be unable to discern what does and does not break a rule. And there seems to be a culture of constant paperwork as a result of this. Forms, applications, proposals, written requests, each of these taking days, weeks, or even months to be processed. And if you so much as fail to submit the correct paperwork on time, you could find yourself in court rather quickly, frantically trying to defend your position while your nation's god watches on with amusement. Now, Fosalors doesn't really get involved with court proceedings, so it's not like you'd have to present your defense to the Archon herself, so it's a little less intimidating but she does maintain the right to alter the verdict of a trial if she so chooses, and she does like to watch basically every trial. Nahida says her personality is a bit unique, so I expect her to be a little volatile. And in any nation where rules are plentiful, there are always a bunch of rule breakers. Yes, we could call them criminals, and there may be a fair amount of those around too, but when I say rule breakers, I'm talking about a specific kind of criminal. I'm talking about people who break the rules to make a statement. Robin Hood types, or like phantom thieves. The type that leave calling cards and announce their plan to steal things ahead of time. People who are out there breaking laws for sport and to irritate the bureaucrats that make the lives of the common people miserable. Their criminal exploits put on display like they were members of a circus. Now I think this may be the roles of the twins from the Travail trailer, Liney and Lynette. At least I'm assuming they're twins. They might not be because one of them has cat ears, but I digress. I think they are criminals by choice and maybe a part of an underground network of people trying to change the administration the only way they think they can. And I think this would make for some very interesting ethical and moral decisions about right and wrong and who should really get to choose what's permitted and what's not. This is the Nation of Justice, after all, and I would be really happy if we got the opportunity to talk philosophically about what justice really means and to who. Now, bureaucracy aside, Fontaine is very invested in technological development, especially through the use of machinery. Most of this machinery seems to be clockwork style, suggesting that Fontaine may be steampunk themed, which would suggest a focus on the events of the Industrial Revolution in the West. At least, that's my best guess. You'll see why in a bit. But this heavy emphasis on machinery means that they need a rather reliable energy source, and while we're not really sure what that energy source is, we can speculate a little bit from what we've learned from some event NPCs so far. Bertrand, a Fontaine toy maker we met during an event, says that the energy system is rather special, but also says it's unsustainable and that they're researching alternative energy solutions. Research for this sort of thing happens through the Fontaine Research Institute, also known as just the Institute, and in recent times the Institute suffered a massive explosion during an experiment involving something called archaeum, which I can only assume is some type of mineral? Or maybe something like uranium? Now I say uranium because the guy who was conducting these experiments was named Edwin Eastinghouse, and his name is a play on Westinghouse, which is currently an electric company. Like, a real one. Westinghouse, among other ventures, designs and develops nuclear reactors. The Westinghouse TR2 model in particular was a pressurized water reactor that experienced a partial core meltdown in 1960. It kind of fits with the explosion event from the Institute, don't you think? And that's kind of why I say Archeum might be a bit more like Uranium. But you know, we're in a magical setting, so it would have to be some kind of elemental thing, so maybe it's kind of like the Acidite from the Conrians, sort of, like a condensed elemental energy thing? I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. 
Going back to Edwin Eastinghouse for a second, his research was aimed at dealing with a quote, waterline crisis. Now, based on the name, it sounds like either the pipes of Fontaine's water lines are broken or deteriorating, or there's just not enough water flowing through them. Something like, uh, maybe there's not enough energy to power the water pumps or something. That would make, you know, an energy source and the water line crisis somewhat related. I'm inclined to believe that this is the case and that Fontaine's primary energy source has something to do with water, if only because it seems to be steampunk themed and you can't really have steampunk without steam and there's no steam without water, right? When it comes to energy generation, typically you generate steam and then steam turns a turbine and the turbine generates energy. So that's my logic here. There may be some additional concern for Fontaine's environment as well, since it is said to have a lot of factories. And that, coupled with the technological development, kind of supports the hypothesis that Fontaine may take inspiration from the Industrial Revolution of the West. Emphasis on the West because steampunk is more of a Western aesthetic than it is an Eastern one. Now, this time period of the Industrial Revolution was fraught with pollution, spiking as early as the mid-1700s. I'm focusing on the whole pollution thing specifically because Fossilors is very invested in this idea of purity, if we judge her by her lines on the hydro gemstone, anyway. The Oceanids, who served the previous Hydro Archon, also put an enormous emphasis on the purity of water, and the former Hydro Archon, who died in the north of Sumeru, turned into the Amrita, a perfectly pristine pool of water. The idea of pollution being another plot point in Fontaine seems very plausible to me, since a nation that represents water in its purest form would find the idea of contamination to be abhorrent. Now, I want to point out that Fosselor's whole thing about purity seems to have more to do with her moral or legal purity, as in, she's done nothing wrong and therefore can never be found guilty. But I think the idea that water can be contaminated in invisible ways would serve as a very fitting allegory for Fosselor's recognizing the flaws in her views of justice and moral purity, and that reality is a bit more nuanced than guilty or not guilty. But speaking of the Hydro Archons, We've already talked a little about Fosslores, but really the only substantial information we have about her comes from Nahida and the Hydro Gemstone. Everything else we have is either vague or just conjecture. However, the one thing we do know about her is that the Oceanids who served the former Archon do not approve of Fossilors. The reason is never explicitly given, but I do wonder if the idea of purity of water has something to do with it. Rodea, the strongest of the Oceanids, left Fontaine for the pure waters of Chingsa, and assumed that Endora, a tiny Oceanid we met during an event, was an assassin sent to destroy her. This is doubled down on in her combat lines. The fact that the Oceanids that left Fontaine believe they would be assassinated suggests that they did not part ways with Fossilors on good terms. And regardless of whether they left or stayed behind, all Oceanids seem to have immense respect for their former Hydro Archon. The ones that stayed behind in Fontaine, for example, make regular pilgrimages to the Vorukasha Oasis in order to pay tribute to her. And it was at this moment that I realized that those of you who have not done the Perry quest in Sumeru or who have not read the lore of the Vorukasha artifacts set probably have no idea what I'm talking about right now. And you're probably a little bit confused about why I keep talking about two Hydro Archons and one of them is Fosalor and one of them is dead and apparently somewhere in the Sumeru desert. So let me now give you a little bit of background on the fate of the former Hydro Archon. 500 years ago, during the Conrian Cataclysm, the Archons were instructed to halt the flow of monsters that were sprouting up from beneath the ground. The two locations that we know about are the Chasm and Tunigi Hollow. Zhongli and the remaining Adepti and the Millilith took care of the Chasm, but both Rukadavada and the former Hydro Archon went to Tunigi Hollow in the north of Sumeru. This implies that this area must border Fontaine. But in the struggle, the former Hydro Archon died, and her body turned into the pristine waters of the Amrita. Rukadavada then grew a tree from this pool in order to anchor the former Hydro Archon's soul to the mortal realm, and thus, the Vorukasha Oasis was formed. In the years following the Cataclysm, a dark hole called the Mark of Apatia would open up in the sky. This mark was said to merely be a reflection of the abyss, but when it appears, it corrupts the surrounding area, so sealing it is quite important. This is also part of the job of the tree of the former Hydro Archon, as you can see the green light shooting up from the tree fighting against the violet light of the mark. 
In the real world, though, Apatia is the name of a demon of drought from Zoroastrianism. This demon took the form of a black horse and had a bloody battle against the rain deity, Tishtraya. In the myth, Apatia won the first round, but Tishtraya won the second. Apatia, in this case, represents the demons of the abyss, and Tristraya represents the former Hydro Archon. Although the former Hydro Archon will not get another chance to fight Apatia on her own. The Peri instead inherited this job. But hey, a fun fact, as a fitting contrast to Apatia's black horse form, Tishtraya was said to have the form of a white horse. And when I think about white horses that are linked closely to the concept of purity, I can only think of unicorns. In contemporary mythology, unicorns are the symbol of absolute purity, and in European folklore, they were generally pure white with cloven hooves, curly manes, and tails with a singular spiral horn that could purge any poison from the body and purify water. For this reason, unicorn horns were often used for medicinal purposes. Although they weren't usually real unicorn horns, they were generally like the, you know, protruding tooth of an narwhal or the, you know, rhinoceros. But all this talk of purity isn't the whole unicorn story. The idea that they were pure beings came about during the medieval periods when the unicorn became associated with Christ and the Virgin Mary. Prior to this and in other parts of the world, unicorns and their kin were thought of as horrifying monsters. They were unpredictable, territorial, and ready to impale anyone with their powerful horns. Now this isn't hard and fast because technically Chilans are considered to be unicorns and they weren't ever really monstrous, I don't think. Maybe someone can correct me on that. Now, I personally have always associated unicorns with water, and I blame this movie for this. This is the last unicorn, and I was obsessed with this as a kid. Watching the unicorns turn into sea foam solidified this connection inside of me forever. But as far as I know, there's no myth to support this connection. Not for unicorns at least. But there are other mythical water horses, most notably the Scottish Kelpie. The Kelpie is a shape-shifting horse that lives inside of bodies of waters and tends to drown people who get too close to them. Sometimes they trick people into riding them and then they just kind of run into the water and sometimes they shape-shift into humans and seduce people and you get the idea. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of like mermaids, but they're more horse-related. Horse-maids. Horse-horse-maidens. But depending on what part of Scotland you look at, the Kelpie can be big and black or slender and white. And I thought that was pretty coincidental given that Apatia had a big black horse form and Tishtraya had a white horse form. In any case, whether it was a Kelpie or a unicorn, I am personally pretty convinced that the former Hydro Archon was a type of horse in their true form. And Fossilors might also be, since the demon from the Ars Goetia with the same name is also known to drown people and also topple warships. Like, she just, like, destroys battleships in the ocean. So that, that's kind of cool. And as for my final Fontaine prediction for this video, I think we're due for quite a bit more lore on Celestia. The logic here is mostly based on patterns. Mondstadt was kind of like a soft introduction to everything since it was our first introduction to the world and all of its problems, and Liwe really established the Fatui as a threat. Inazuma gave us prehistory and some insight into visions, and Sumeru was all about Ermansol and the structure of the world, and we get Abyss and Conria lore at pretty regular intervals in every nation, and the Fatui are also now in every region, and we're constantly getting new historical tidbits all over the place. And since Apep basically said the line in Travail that Danesliff used for Natlin, I think we'll have a heavy focus on dragons in Natlin. So that kind of leaves Celestia as the one remaining mystery. So Fontaine seems a really good opportunity to learn about that. And according to my buddy Whale Milk, who actually did the math to triangulate Celestia's location on the map, it should be hovering right over Fontaine. Now, Fontaine is all about technological development, law, and order. It's likely about rules and testing the limits of what you can do within a set boundary. And Celestia is the ultimate judge, jury, and executioner. Fossilors even taunts them, daring them to judge her in her lines from the Hydro Gemstone. And in my experience, bluffs like that are often called out, and they do not end well.
And I think that's all I have. It's short and sweet today, but hey, what about you? What are your predictions for Fontaine? What kind of mythology or folklore do you think it'll pull from? Let me know down below because we are getting to the end of Sumeru and I think it's about time we started to get a little hyped up. Although, I'll be real with you, I still have Deshert on the brain and I'm probably gonna do at least one more video on him before we leave the Sand Nation, so just be aware of that. Anyway, I just want to thank you guys for making it to the end of this surprisingly short video, for me anyways, and a very special thank you to all of my channel members for supporting me and the things I do. I love that you guys love lore, so I'm gonna make a whole lot more. So until we meet again in the next video, take care guys, and remember to drink some water. Like, right now. Go on, just like, take, take, drink.